Hello everybody, welcome back to Alan Walls Photography. This is Alan and today it is circle of confusion number four. Today I'm going to answer three questions I got about ultraviolet macro photography. Interesting questions, interesting topic. Actually, it was two questions about ultraviolet photography and one question about ultraviolet photography. I'm hoping that third one was just a spelling mistake. Before we dive into this fascinating circle of confusion, two quick announcements. Number one, I've done a fair amount of work over on Discord and kind of clean things up. And uh, yeah, by all means, if you haven't been over there, please do. I'll put a, an invitation link in the show notes. The second thing is this. From time to time, you may see an affiliate link for some piece of equipment or other that I mention in a video. It will be clearly marked that it's an affiliate link. Uh, I'm only going to use these affiliate links for stuff that I own or stuff that I would buy from the link that I'm showing you. Uh, I check them out carefully before I put the links in there. I haven't used any of them uh, yet, but if you end up wanting something that I talk about and you go over there and you end up buying it from them, I get a tiny sliver uh, of a commission. Just so you know, if you have any questions, let me know. So this series of questions uh, was started out by one of my Patreon supporters, Robert Starost, who had some specific questions about macro and UVIVF. And then I got a couple of more general questions and thought the best way to deal with it would just be to cover uh, a general overview of what the two different types of ultraviolet photography are. So there are two different kinds of ultraviolet photography. One of them involves taking photographs of ultraviolet energy. Uh, that is called reflective UV photography. And to do that, you need a, a good strong source of UV energy. And the sun is probably about the best you're going to find. Uh, and a camera uh, that has uh, been modified so that it's able to actually record the UV energy that, that uh, impinges on the sensor. Now, to do that, you have to tear your camera apart um, and remove some of the filtering uh, material between the, the sensor and the world. Um, it, I, I'm pretty adventurous, but uh, I have never owned a camera rubbishy enough to, to try to convert it for UV. Though I'll tell you, I absolutely love UV photography when it's done well. Uh, you've probably seen it. Um, we used it in medicine a fair amount uh, to, to look for skin lesions and that type of thing. But uh, the images are monochrome, but there's a depth to them and a feel to them that's quite unique to UV photography. But that's actually not what we're going to talk about today. Because first of all, I've, I've never actually done it. I've, I've never modified a camera or, or, or had one. Um, I don't even think I have a lens. No, I have a couple of lenses that would be UV safe that don't have any UV blocking filtration in them, like my uh, uh, 50 millimeter 1.8 D from Nikon. That's a good one to use for, for uh, UV reflective photography. The other kind of UV photography, the one that has uh, real application in the macro world is called UVIVF. That's ultraviolet induced visible fluorescence photography. And it is completely different from UV reflective photography. You're not photographing UV uh, energy with your camera. So your camera doesn't need to be modified. What you're measuring is light, visible light. So to help uh, refresh your memory about ultraviolet radiation, I got a, a short plastic uh, physicist doctor friend of mine to uh, draw out an electromagnetic spectrum for me. Now, the way this, uh, this black line is representing energy uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, 
all the way from on the left, the very highest energy, most dangerous, shortest wavelength energy, all the way to the right, where we find the longest wavelengths, the lowest energy, and uh, the electromagnetic radiation on the right side of this continuum is uh, radio waves. And as you move a little bit uh, to the left into a slightly higher energy range, you come across microwaves, same things that you use in your oven to cook. And uh, beyond that, you run into infrared, which is slightly lower energy than visible light. Now let's pop over to the other end for a minute. High energy, short wavelength, things like gamma radiation and x-rays, very dangerous stuff. And there's visible light tucked up against infrared on one side and ultraviolet on the other. Now the span of ultraviolet is pretty impressive. It goes from uh, one nanometer wavelength on the left all the way to 400 nanometers, right as it abuts up against visible violet. And uh, the, the range is from one to 400 nanometers. Uh, visible light goes up to 750 nanometers. 365 is an important wavelength, and I'm gonna tell you why now. I'm gonna take just a second to explain what happens in UV-IVF because it's so interesting, but there are a, a group of complex molecules that exist in nature. Some animals have them, some plants have them, uh, and some minerals have them. But these chemicals are called fluorophores. These molecules are able to absorb or take in the energy from UV radiation. Different fluorophores will absorb energy at different levels from UV. Uh, so the response of a fluorophore is rather dependent on the amount of energy in the UV. And the amount of energy increases as the wavelength of the energy gets shorter. Normally, uh, in photography, we're talking about UVA. It's called long wavelength UV energy. But these fluorophores I was mentioning, uh, they take in that energy when they're exposed to it. They use it as part of their metabolic pathway and they emit light with a lower energy, meaning a longer wavelength. And if UV light is right on the border of visible light, then any energy that is emitted from one of these fluorophores tends to fall in the visible spectrum, which means, I know that's complicated, but what this means is if you expose something that contains fluorophores to ultraviolet energy at the right wavelength, that fluorophore containing a spider, for example, will absorb the UV, it'll use the energy that it needs to for whatever it's doing with the energy, and then it will emit what's left in the form of visible light. And that's what we call fluorescence. So you can shine invisible UV energy onto things that contain fluorophores, and then the fluorophores will glow with the fluorescence as they re-emit the absorbed energy. Does that make sense to you? I hope that's clear. Um, I'm trying, I, I've been trying to think of an analogy that would make sense, but uh, they all involve the GI tract and probably wouldn't be safe for the channel. But the beauty of UV-IVF is that though, yes, you do need to invest in a source of UV energy, you don't need a special camera. You don't need any fancy filters or lenses uh, because you're not photographing UV light, remember. You're photographing emitted visible light. So it's ultraviolet induced visible fluorescence photography. And it's the visible fluorescence that we capture on our sensor.
Now, a couple of really important things that will totally mess up your UVIVF if you don't know about them in, in advance. They all involve the UV source of energy. Now, you can buy UV flashlights, we'll call them, even though they, they're not supposed to put out any light. And a vast number of them are rubbish and not appropriate for UV IVF. These days, most UV sources are LEDs. They're, they're energy emitting diodes like light LEDs only. They're emitting at a higher energy. Now, most of them fall somewhere around 400, 390 to 400 nanometers in wavelength. So in addition to putting out a little bit of UV energy, they're also putting out a bunch of bluish, purplish light. And any light, when you're trying to photograph fluorescence, will destroy the fluorescence. And that's key. If you have visible light, it will completely overwhelm your sensor's ability to record the, the very subtle light of fluorescence. That's so important. It, it also is why you need to do UV-IVF in a dark room, or the way I do it is in my uh, macro cage with a velvet drapes on it, so that it is really dark in there. Uh, I was actually planning on doing a whole video on this when I pulled out my own UV uh, energy source. It's dead as a doornail and I don't even know where to begin to, uh, to fix it, but I'm working on it. There are a number of brands out there that can be trusted and a number that, that will, will disappoint. If you see one on sale for $15, you're going to be disappointed because it's going to probably just be a purple light. If you buy one at one of those shops that your daughters like to shop at in the mall that sell black light bulbs, definitely don't buy one of those. It's just a purple light. But if you want to do some serious uh, induced fluorescence photography, there is one uh, trusted source of UV LEDs by the name of Nichia. You'll know you're probably buying a Nichia UV LED if the flashlight you're looking at costs $300. Um, if it costs $5, it's not going to be a real uh, quality UV energy source. In addition to having some visible light pollution, some of these uh, less expensive UV LEDs will also emit some infrared energy. And that can interfere with your photography too. So probably the safest way is to look for uh, an energy source that is not cheap and that clearly states that it uses um, a Nichia uh, chip or a Nichia LED. Now, a really good energy source will also have what's called a band pass filter, uh, either in it or in front of it. And a bandpass filter is uh, a filter that allows only certain wavelengths to pass. And if you have a good bandpass filter, uh, one of the more popular ones is the Hoyer U340, uh, which are commercially available. And if you have one of those, it tends to filter out any contaminating light so that your UV energy is truly invisible, pure UV. Um, there are other ways to get relatively pure UV energy onto your subject so that it will absorb it and then emit the energy as visible light. One of those uh, is a, a, a flash, a speed light. Speed lights and studio lights put out a lot of UV energy uh, and uh, simply remove the UV filter from in front of the bulb. But once you take them out, if you don't electrocute yourself or destroy the flash, then you will need to add a filter, a bandpass filter, large enough to cover all of the output. Because what you're going to be putting out of that flash is, is full spectrum light. So it's going to be a lot of energy in all the wavelengths, all the way from 
IR down into the UV range and you want to block out everything except the UV. And that's what a bandpass filter would do. So if you wanted to do that, you'd have to buy a flash, take it apart and buy a good quality um, filter like uh, a full size Hoyer U340 or a Bardi U. And uh, there are several, I'll list a couple in the, in the notes below. Uh, so then all you have to do is get into a completely dark place with your spider and you would prep the, the, the spider. I'm, I keep saying spider because spiders, crickets, um, lace wings, these, these bugs actually uh, do emit fluorescent light when they're excited by UV. By no means, not all insects do that. None of the wasps and bees do it at all. And beetles generally don't do it either. So you've got to do a little bit of homework and find out whether or not your species does emit fluorescence. Get it in a dark uh, place, somewhere you can control the light and keep it pitch black. And then just use that single flash, if you've modified a flash, or use that single UV light source pointing at your, uh, at your um, specimen. And then all you have to do is take photographs. You do need to use uh, a slightly higher ISO, slow shutter speeds, because you're photographing a, a dim glow coming from the insect or the plant. Uh, so that's, that's about enough. Let me just finish up by saying, it, for real, please be careful with this stuff. I mean, you can't see it and uh, it does seriously damage retinas and cause cataracts. It's, it's high energy and you want to keep it out of your eyes and off your skin. So get a good pair of, um, of UV goggles if you're going to be trying this out. Seriously, you don't want to. And do not open a speed light unless you know exactly what you're doing. Those things have capacitors in them that hold enough energy to kill you dead if you, if you bridge it. So yeah, just forget I ever said anything about flashes. <laughs> just buy a UV flashlight. So as soon as I can get my hands on another UV LED, I'll plan on doing a full length video to show you uh, how to do the how to actually do the shoot thanks for dropping by full length video coming out in a couple of days until then take care see you soon